Defense of anger in the workplace. Interview with Bronwyn Shortcuts. When you are angry, what do you do? Do you suppress it or express it? What can you do? Our society usually pathologizes anger, yet it is the natural human feeling. If you'd like to learn how anger affects us in workplace, in personal lives, and how to make it work, then you're in the right place. Our guest today is going to share some of the most effective anger management techniques. So stay tuned. You're watching Happy and Healthy Mind program episode 124. And our guest today, Bronwyn Schwagert, may be the most evocative psychotherapist you've ever heard. Instead of fixing people's messes, her goal is to elicit feelings people are most ashamed to have, such as hatred and rage. She knows that even though feelings are invisible, they don't evaporate, but store away in our bodies until processed. These feelings, and we all have them, haunt us and cause the mental illness until we express them into words with someone who can hear and validate them. She also has a podcast and practices therapy in California. And I'm your host, Dr. Rosina Lakani. I'm a psychiatrist, speaker, and author. I help women leaders reverse burnout using their own genetic code. In addition to helping people with depression, anxiety, and burnout, I try to help people optimize their mental wellness with precision medicine. I believe that our mind is the software that runs the hardware of our brain and our body. Therefore, I share practical tips for mental fitness here. If you need specific medical advice, please consult your healthcare professional. But if you find this content helpful, then join our mission of eradicating preventable suffering by liking, subscribing, and sharing so more people can live and perform at their best with hope, health, and happiness. All right, so let's learn from our guests. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, Dr. Rosina. So tell me, how did this topic become important in your life? Yeah, so I didn't go looking for it, and I didn't go looking to become a therapist, actually. I, as most people can relate to who've been alive for, you know, more than 10 or 15 years, I uh, had like a life crisis where I had to move, relocate with my family about an hour and a half away from where I had settled in and had my home. And this was, hmm, this was about 15 years ago now. And I fell into a very severe depression. During that time, I sought out therapy. And even though I was barely functioning, I remember, and I sought up sought out multiple therapists. I, I remember feeling like, you know, I, even though I can hardly function, I'm pretty sure I could be a better therapist than the ones I'm encountering. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I could help myself better than they're helping me. So uh, I went back to school in my forties and became, got a master, a second master's degree, but this was a master's in counseling to become a licensed marriage and family therapist. And, you know, during that whole time I went in and out of um, about three different depressive episodes that were really significant over a course of about 10 years. And I can now with absolute clarity see how each one of those severe depressive episodes was actually a result of suppressed anger from feeling betrayed mm. by people in my life who I trusted to care for me and who weren't, mm -hmm. who were basically failing me emotionally. Mm -hmm. So the most salient one is when I first started out as a therapist, I was an intern getting my hours, starting at a counseling center. The counseling director, the, the man who directed it, he was also a therapist. He was also my supervisor and I trusted him. You know, I was just starting out. I was technically still a student. I'd never seen a client professionally before. And he really betrayed me at that time. For example, he told me that my first client was waiting to be seen. And I said, oh, okay, cool. And he said, yeah, it's a couple, like as in a married couple. And I said, I, I'm not ready to do a couple. You know, I'm not, I'm barely ready to see an individual. You know, I know couples are way harder and any licensed therapist can tell you couples are a whole different ballgame. Yes. They, they really need a seasoned 
therapist who knows how to manage a couple who knows what they're doing. And this supervisor said, nope, this is going to be your first client, the couple. He completely dismissed my feelings and I felt absolutely betrayed and angry, but I didn't feel entitled to my anger because I didn't have anyone around me going, you know what, Bronwyn, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say, you know what, if you can't respect my no and respect me, I'm going to find a different center to get my hours at and a different supervisor. I didn't have anyone mirroring what I was going through for me. And I felt very alone. And I felt because I was just starting out and he's the director and he's my supervisor. I didn't feel in entitled to that anger. I didn't feel like it was legitimate. And so it just went in inward. And I went into this very, very severe depressed depression. And, you know, I ended up being a therapist to this couple and I did the worst job by them. And I knew it and I knew I wasn't qualified to help them. It just like bankrolled and it just got snowballed. It just got so bad. So that's just one example. But and many times like depression could be caused by many different things. And so the root cause, root cause be, could be different. But you realize that in your situation, your depression root cause was that suppressed anger. Well, I would actually argue that all depression is from suppressed anger. Mm -hmm and all anxiety and all panic and all mania. I mean, I would argue actually every mental illness is a direct result of suppressed anger at the people who betray us. So it's not someone who cuts us off on the freeway because they're not betraying us. We don't know them. It's usually our parent, our spouse, our supervisor at work, someone we trusted and we don't feel entitled to feel angry and then act with boundaries, with assertiveness. And so it goes inward and we get depressed or anxious or have mm -hmm. panic attacks or whatnot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is one opinion that everything could be related to the suppressed anger. There are biological reasons for depression too. And there, many, there could be inflammation. There could be other, other reasons too. But I think anger is one of the major cause in many situations. So you, you realize that, you know, anger was the issue. And so that's when you started focusing on that. Tell me, once you were able to process anger properly, how did the life change? Yeah. So, you know, it was my own experience. And then when I became a therapist, just seeing it in my clients over and over, you know, PTSD, I would notice people with PTSD would kind of just repeat these stories and they'd stay kind of stuck on this one part of their story where they were betrayed. You know, let's say, a woman who had a birth at a hospital, she felt betrayed by the nurse who took away her agency during her birth. And that's where she was stuck. And so I would just see it over and over how that suppressed anger goes inward and it makes us sick. And um, yeah. And so just helping my clients, helping myself to just say, you know what, first of all, your anger is valid anger. Like I, like we said in the, um, the intro, we pathologize it. Why, why does anger have to be bad? Why does it have to be, you know, something that we shun or say, oh, you have to manage? Yes, anger can result in violence and verbal violence and yelling and screaming. It's true. It can result in those things. But I liken anger to a fire. So yes, fire can be dangerous and get out of control and be destructive. But when we contain it in a fireplace... And, you know, in Western civilization, we don't appreciate a fireplace anymore because we have electricity now. But for all of human history, you couldn't survive without a fire pit or a fireplace or a hearth, hearth, hearth where there was fire. It brings light and heat into the entire house. So we contained anger is necessary for us to survive. We need it, it as long as it's contained in a healthy way. So by saying, you know what, it's OK to be angry. And what is my anger helping me to do right now? It's help, It's telling me something's really wrong. It's telling me, it's like a light on the dashboard of the car saying, check the engine. Something is in need of repair. So what's wrong? Oh, you know, I'm not being, you know, helped by someone who is supposed to help me. I can be angry at that. I can know my anger is valid. And with my anger, I can use my voice to be assertive and say, you know what? 
this isn't okay. I need you to stop or I need you to start advocating for me or whatever that is and then have boundaries. Okay. So you're not respecting me. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I need a break from you. I need some kind of boundary mm -hmm. in my life with, with this situation or this person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I, I'm still kind of going to wondering when people do practice anger expression and processing in a healthy manner, how does life change? And especially because we're talking about effect of anger in workplace, when somebody is able to contain and process the anger in a healthy manner at workplace, how does things change at workplace and for individual and, and the organization? Yeah, I guess it depends on the situation in the workplace, right? You know, in my situation as an intern, I wasn't getting paid intern therapy and interns don't get paid. I could have said, you know what, I'm out of here. Like this is wrong and I'm not going to tolerate this. So that's one example is just leave the workplace. And I would have to, because this was the director and he was also my supervisor, but also, you know, that's easy to say. I wasn't getting paid. I wasn't like making a mortgage with the money I was making easier said than done. Right. So, you know, with my clients, I will help them just, you know, it starts with saying no, you know, if you're working with someone who is treating you like they're a monster, you don't have to say, oh, I just want to believe the best in this person. You know, I have clients say, I want to see the good in everyone. And I say, you know what? Yeah, that's really ideal, <laughs> but we don't live in an ideal world. So how about instead of saying, I want to see the good and get along with everyone, instead we can say, I'm open to seeing the good when I see the good. And I'm open to getting along with people I can get along with. Because there's some people who are going to feel threatened by us in the workplace. They're going to try to sabotage that. They're going to be passive aggressive. There's a lot of people who they're you know, just monster parts really come out in the workplace. They feel threatened. They can't see a coworker's success as a team. They see it more as like, oh, if she succeeds, I don't, I fail. And they feel like there's this, you know, threat going on instead of a collaborative team approach. And if I can see that and go, okay, this isn't a me problem that this person's treating me like this. This is actually a them problem then that's that's first and foremost the start is go okay i'm okay this person's the problem and i can figure out how to relate with them in the way that best works for me knowing that i'm doing everything in my power and i can accept that and know that my anger is valid right now mm -hmm. yeah so that brings an interesting point so let's kind of jump on to how we can we can say how we can cope in a situation like this. So you suppressed your anger in that internship situation. It became depression. Mm -hmm. Now that you are able to express it in a healthy manner, how does it feel? Does it feel more, you feel more empowered? Do you feel more in control? Or do you feel this anger runs your life and then it becomes out of control? No, I think anger runs our life when we try to pretend we're not angry. So if we're like, oh, I'm a pleaser, I just want to make everyone happy, what we're doing, first of all, is we're pretending we're not angry when we are. And again, that anger, just because it's invisible or that resentment, just because it's invisible doesn't mean it doesn't exist. In fact, I think our feelings are more real than anything that is tangible. It's inside of me now, my resentment, and it's leaking out into all kinds of other areas where it doesn't belong. So people who are pleasers, they can act all nicey nice, but their anger leaks out in other ways and it harms them. And it sometimes harms the people who least deserve it, like their children or, you know, their dogs or whatever. So we can't, we can't just compartmentalize it. That really backfires. And, and the other thing is when we do that, we're betraying ourselves. And that's a big thing. Like we're betraying us and we're not happy. You can't have good mental health if you are chronically betraying yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's very obvious that we need to 
be able to process it. So now question is, let's see if you are in a in a work situation and somebody says something or does something that that is making you angry how do you control the anger in that moment so that you don't lash out or you don't say or do things that you regret later that's a great question yes so i would start you know yeah so if you're working with this person and you can't change that you can't create a boundary because you're not the boss you know just knowing that is one thing but i would start with like let's say they make a really snidey passive aggressive comment to me right i would just in that moment just be like okay it's okay to be angry I, i'm gonna feel it i'm not gonna suppress it i'm not gonna pretend i'm not angry i'm not gonna lash out either because that would be counterproductive but i'm not gonna force it down I'm just going to be like, okay, I feel it. I feel it here in my chest and it makes me mad. And then I would, you know, follow up by just, you know, I might say something to this person. Let's say it were a coworker. So if it's a peer that's different than your boss, let's say it were a coworker who felt threatened by me and so would make some kind of passive aggressive comments. I would say, you know, that's really not okay to say things like that. I would just, you know, look them right in the eyes and maintain eye contact and not back down and say, you know, that's not okay. I don't appreciate that. And so what if they become either, you know, in those situations, either some people, oh, I was just joking or, or they would kind of become more mean and more aggressive. What do you do in that situation? If you say, oh, okay, you know, that comment was not justified or that's not mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. And then they say, well, you know, you are doing something bad or you are stupid or something like that. Well, how would you respond to that? Yeah. So if they defended themselves, like the first uh, example you gave of like, oh, I didn't mean that. Well, if they say that, I know I've won. I know I just got through to them because they're defending themselves. And when we defend ourselves, that means it got through to us and we're feeling defensive Mm -hmm. and they probably won't do it again. Because people who are bullies, they don't do eye contact. They don't do direct confrontation. And I just did it. And even though they defended themselves, I think that probably was all they needed. Mm -hmm. Now, if they come back and say, well, you are kind of blah, blah, whatever. I would say, okay, so good to know. Can we like set aside a time that we can talk about this? Because this is is important that you really feel like that. And I want to hear... What's going on for you? I want to hear if you're you're feeling resentful of me, if there's something I did. Can we like create a time that we can talk this through? Because I don't want us to have these little passive aggressive exchanges anymore. That's not good for our workplace environment. That's wonderful. So you are direct, but assertive, but not aggressive. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. And so we talked about like, Okay, so it would affect if somebody doesn't respond in this healthy manner and they lash out, how does that impact overall team environment or work environment? If somebody is like irate and somebody kind of keeps on saying bad things and keep going Mm -hmm. around, how does that affect not only just that person, but people around them? Well, in that case, I would document all those things. And if I were in person, I would be videoing it. I would, or, you know, document it by recording it audio on the, on my smartphone. I would document all that and bring it to my supervisor or his supervisor or her supervisor. If I'm having that kind of experience, like over and over repeated, I would document it in my notes and just write the date and time and just document because you know, we live in the United States. We live in supposedly a democratic country where there are checks and balances and people can't continually get away with this. So I guess though overall, Rosina, Dr. Rosina is when someone's bullying us, what the one thing they can't handle is the truth. So if I'm documenting it and and showing them, you know, I am keeping tabs on everything you're doing on my phone or in my notes, I'm writing date and time. And I want to let you know, because I'm going to be sharing it with the people above us. They can't handle that. Or if I'm directly confronting them and saying, you know, that's not okay for you to say. They can't handle that. So, so that's kind of the overarching solution 
to this kind of, you know, bullying is to just maintain that eye contact, don't back down and, and reflect the truth and don't let people uh, gaslight you or make it you second guess yourself. You have to know what the reality is and then reflect that reality back to them or back to the people above them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I can see many times when situations like that happen, either people leave the work because they can't handle it or they feel miserable working. And if you're mm-hmm. working eight hours a day, uh, five days a week, then every day it kind of keeps on building up in your body. So yes. let's kind of talk about how does anger affect your body? You, know, you said that it kind of goes in. You just, you shared the example of that you became depressed. But share with us a little bit more in terms of how does anger suppressed in the body affects us individually? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that too. Um, so my first career before I became a therapist was actually, I was a nutritionist. My first okay. master's degree is in nutrition. And I always was like, oh, it's everything. All these health disorders are just a nutrition matter. And, you know, I have to say, I still believe that to, to a great degree, but the more I am a therapist, the more I'm like, oh, a lot of these are manifestations of suppressed anger. I believe actually that a lot of autoimmune disorders are connected with people who just have like chronic suppressed anger. I really am starting to believe that more and more. It's like they're, and you know, I, you're a doctor, so you know this, but you know, the word in the Greek where we get like histamine and antihistamine, it literally means that those, those white blood cells are, what it means is they're standing, they're resisting. It's like they're, they're not relaxed. They're not, um, like I said, a lot of autoimmune disorders are from suppressed anger. I have a lot of clients with like, you know, chronic, just chronic pain for no apparent reason, migraines. Oh my goodness. Those are so linked to lifelong chronic anger. I see it over and over and over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so not only suppressed anger can cause mental illnesses, but it can also cause physical illnesses. Mm -hmm. And I think the anger itself kind of activates the body and gets into the stress reactivity mode. And then all the cascade of events that happens kind of lead to both physical and mental illnesses. And so how do you control anger? Like you said, that you want to express it or you want to express it in the healthy manner. But sometimes sometimes it's not easy. So first is, you know, you need to recognize that you do have, you are feeling angry. How do you recognize it? And then once you recognize it, if you don't have capacity to, you know, express it, let's say it's your boss or it's some, you know, it's a political figure that you're angry at or, or whatever is happening in the environment that you're feeling frustrated and angry about, how do you handle situations like that when when the person either is not right in front of you or it's not a particular person you're angry at, you're angry at your situation or you're angry at the environment or angry at other people's behavior that you don't have direct communication with? Mm. How, do you, how do you control anger in those situations? I do. I mean, yeah, we get angry at, you know, political figures and at, you know, society at large and what we see in the nightly news. But I would liken those more to when someone cuts us off on the freeway. It's not a betrayal. They're not people that we were trusting to care for us. So I don't think we hold that in our bodies to the same degree. It's really the people that we trust. So it could be, like I said, like a nurse who helped a woman deliver her baby in the hospital who was in a position of, you know, to be a caretaker or a caregiver. And that woman felt betrayed, or it could be a doctor who said, no, 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 you're fine. And then it turns out, no, they actually had widespread cancer and the doctor didn't do the tests, you know, so it's someone in a position that should have made good and and should have been responsible and failed us at some level that really causes, I think, the anger that afflicts us most in our bodies. 
it's interesting. I think most of us know at some level intuitively. I had a client recently and she was having panic attacks while driving on the freeway. And I said, okay, who are you angry at? And she's like, what do you mean? And, and then turns out at the end of the session, she goes, I kind of wonder if this was about that person before I, I, you know, I saw you. She goes, I kind of knew at an intuitive level, this had to do with that person who betrayed me. Cause in the whole session, she was like, no, it can't be that. It can't be that. And I'm like, no, it's that. And finally at the end, she goes, I kind of knew it at some level before I even met with you. So I really believe that we have inner wisdom. We have an intuition that a lot of us as, as children were taught to kind of override. We have like an intuitive sense and we can pay attention and we, we kind of know who we're being betrayed by or have felt betrayed by and why that anger is in our bodies. Yeah. But you're saying that it's only the individuals that, you know, that we trust and they betrayed us. Yeah. I think anger can come from many different places, not just in relationship. You focus on the relationship anger. So you kind of, I feel that it's the combination. It's, I, I think the frustration with being late at the place because you're stuck in the traffic and you can feel angry mm -hmm. because of the traffic. Yeah. You feel oh, yeah. angry, but it doesn't haunt you. I'm not saying you don't get angry, but it doesn't haunt us internally to the same degree. Not, not to the same degree. Yeah. No. And so we can continue to talk about this. You know, this is a, such a, such a natural human experience. And what I, I feel is that anger, like you said, is a barometer or like, you know, a signal mm -hmm. that something needs adjustment and it's not the anger that is bad, but it's how you express it or handle it. Either you are lashing out or being aggressive, that makes it not good, or you are suppressing it completely and not acknowledging. And that's not good because both can yeah. lead to problems, both individually, in relationship, whether it be work relationship or home relationship. And so we can potentially continue to discuss in our next session, but at this point in time, we need to kind of wrap up our session. So what would be your one advice or take home message for our audience today? Yeah, I would look at anger in a new light. I think most importantly is our relationship with anger. We all have a relationship with anger and we need to be aware of what that is and adjust it. So it's a healthy relationship. Like my body is telling me right now something's wrong and I don't have to ignore that anymore. And I also don't have to let that explode. I can, you know, maybe we saw a parent explode and that we don't want to be that person, but we also don't have to keep it internal. We can have a healthy relationship with anger. And when we develop a healthy relationship with anger, we actually develop a really healthy relationship with ourselves. And that creates mental health for us and everyone around us. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And so if people want to hear more about what you have to say, how can they listen to you? Yep. My podcast on the screen, it's called Angry at the Right Things. I would love for people to hear more. I'm a big proponent for really elaborating on, you know, kind of some of the things I've covered today and, and lots more. Wonderful, wonderful. And thank you for sharing your gift. And that that is what to do with anger. If anybody wants to get this resource, you can head to our website, happyandhealthymind.com and check the resources. And you'll be able to find this at other sources shared by our wonderful guest in this program. And so let me leave you with this message. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. What are you going to choose today? Are you going to let life pass by and continue to suppress this, these feelings that you think may be wrong? Or are you going to acknowledge them and find this balance of expressing in a healthy manner, putting boundaries and taking care of yourself so you can be the best version of you and improve your workplace relationship, your family relationship, and the relationship with yourself. The choice is yours. 
Until next time, Dr. Rosina. And thank you for joining London.